Hello, and thank you for joining us for the University of St. Francis Lecture Series, a virtual program of the Allen County Public Library. Today's program is entitled Antibiotics and Infections. Dr. Michael Beechel will discuss how antibiotics work and why they fail, as well as the ramifications of entering the post-antibiotics world. My name is Steve Miller. I'm a reference librarian here at the Main Library in the Business Science and Technology Department, and I'll be the host for today's program. This program is being recorded for future viewing on YouTube, so in order to improve the quality of everyone's listening experiences, your microphones have been muted. If you have a question or comment, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We will use chat to facilitate a question and answer session at the end of the program. The purpose of this program is to present topics of interest and research information to the residents of Allen County and to provide a platform for the University of St. Francis faculty members to share their passion for their subjects with the library's patrons. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Beechel, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of St. Francis. Dr. Beechel has a BS in Molecular and Cellular Biology from the University of St. Francis and a PhD in Microbiology and Immunology from the University of Toledo. Michael? Excellent. Thank you so much for that introduction, Steve, and thank you for the opportunity to come back here today. It's, it's great to be here. Um, today we're going to have a, a nice discussion about infections and how they interact with us in our daily lives and the antibiotics that we use to hopefully relieve these infections and um, what maybe issues will be popping up here. And so as we move into day, to today's lecture, um, I kind of want to have three major goals to follow. The first thing I'd like to do is kind of discuss the history of antibiotics here in the United States, then go over some of the challenges that we're facing today in the medical and clinical settings. And then if we don't move forward with those challenges and, and come up with solutions, what the po future could possibly look like if we were to enter a post-antibiotic era. So to start off today, I'd just like to provide you with an overall brief history of where we started with antibiotics here in the United States. So if we look at the timeline, it's actually relatively recent um, you know, in, in American history that we've had antibiotics um, at our disposal. It wasn't until the early 1900s that we really had antibiotics to be of use. Um, the earliest example that we can find of antimicrobials is as early as 1910. We had a kind of basic treatment uh, for syphilis. And at the time, this was called um, the magic bullet. The goal with the magic bullet was to be able to treat an infection by killing a bacteria, but without damaging the host. That was the true motivation of trying to come up with these antimicrobial therapies. Well, after that first discovery in 1910, um, we knew we had something in terms of antibiotics, but progress was relatively slow. It wasn't until briefly afterwards in 1928 that Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. And we'll talk a little bit about that story this evening. Then after the 20s, we had kind of a boom when it comes to antibiotics. Several categories and classes of antibiotics were discovered over the next several decades. Um, unfortunately, quickly after these antibiotics were discovered, we started seeing antibiotic resistance. And this anti antibiotic resistance has really taken hold in today's infections, and we're seeing the spread of antibiotic resistance globally. And so we're going to talk about those challenges today and what can we do to try to um, kind of stave off this infiltration of antibiotic resistance that we're seeing. Because we have only a limited time together, um, we're not going to talk about all of the antibiotic options that are out there. But I did want to show you at least this list of the top 10 antibiotic classes. So you can take the hundreds of antibiotics that are available and put them functionally into 10 major classes. And so instead of going through all 10 of these today, I thought I'd just give you a few examples of the three most commonly used classes of antibiotics and a little bit of information about them. The first one I think many of you are probably familiar with are the category of the penicillins. 
So penicillin, again, first discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming, pictured here in the top right corner of the screen, um, was truly by mistake. Um, Alexander Fleming was actually studying the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus and ran into a situation where some of his plates, which he was experimenting with, became contaminated. Very common thing that we see in the laboratory. However, Alexander noticed something when he looked at his plates. These plates that had this fungal contamination on them also showed something else interesting. Any of the plates that were contaminated with this specific fungus, which was penicillium, his bacteria that he was studying, Staphylococcus, would not grow close to it. It seemed like the Staphylococcus aureus was more or less evading or staying away from the fungus. Um, he decided to dive in, ask the question why, and, and studied the, the situation further. Ultimately discovered that there was a chemical produced by this fungus penicillium called penicillin and was ultimately able to isolate that chemical and show that it actually can kill Staphylococcus aureus. So the neat part about that story is it was a complete accident. Fleming could have just simply taken those contaminated plates, thrown them in the trash can and made more plates. It happens every day in the laboratory. But instead he made an observation, saw something interesting and really pursued it. So after discovering this penicillin, um, it created a boom. So by the 30s and 40s, um, the use of penicillin really exploded. You can see here in this image, there is an individual that is putting up a sign that says, we have penicillin in stock here. I believe this is a Walgreens store. And um, what was interesting about the penicillin was you could just go pick it up from the store like you would a gallon of milk. So if you had an infection or you had some other type of, of issue, you could just simply walk over to your corner Walgreens. You could pick up a gallon. Typically, they were sold in half gallon or gallon glass jars of penicillin and take it home. The problem with this is people would self-dose. You know, if they got an infection or they just had a cut that just maybe looked a little bad, they would just take a shot of their penicillin. Um, if they had a cut on their arm, they might wrap it in an old t-shirt and just dump the penicillin on the wrapping. And so people were really using this antibiotic at will. Um, also, this bottom right image also, I think, belies the treatment of how we, we worked with penicillin early on. Here's a mailbox from around World War II. And if you read the mailbox, it says, penicillin cures gonorrhea in four hours. See your doctor today. Let that sink in for a moment. That's the message that we were sending in World War II. So very interesting advertising, very easy accessibility. Um, everything seemed good at the time. Um, penicillins are bactericidal, meaning that if you get an infection and you apply a penicillin, it'll kill the infection. Everything seemed great. Unfortunately, because of this broad use and misuse of penicillin, we quickly started to see antibiotic resistance with penicillin. And what happened there is we had to then go in to the chemistry, tweak that molecule to make it effective. And so we started this race where we started off with the first generation of penicillins, we saw resistance, and then moved on to the second generation of penicillins and so on. And so a theme you'll start to see is that we create antibiotics, there's a developed resistance, and we have to come up with a new tool. So that's kind of where the party really started. Pen antibiotics in general took off with this penicillin category. Um, today, the next major category that I want to discuss is the second most commonly used category of antibiotics, and those are your cephalosporins. So cephalosporins really were discovered, um, again, around that World War II era, 1945. They're also bactericidal, meaning that they're going to kill infections and, and, and kill that bacteria. Um, the advantage that cephalosporins have, however, is that their chemistry is a bit different. So if you look at the bottom right of this figure here, you'll see cephalosporins share much of the chemistry of penicillins, but they're just slightly different in this ring structure here. 
What that means is that those cephalosporins are resistant to enzymes that bacteria can secrete that dissolve penicillin. We'll get more into that later, but it really set this class of antibiotic apart because it provided uh, another avenue and a separate way for treating infections. Now, you won't be able to read this at home, but the top right image here, you can see that there have also, just like there's been several generations of penicillins, there have also been several generations of cephalosporins. The first generation of cephalosporins had several options as well as the second generation. By the time we got to the third generation of cephalosporins, wow, well over a dozen options, things look great. But as we continued to develop these re resistances, the fourth and fifth generation, you can see the numbers of new medications have quickly died off. It really is an arms race that we're constantly trying to fight with these infections. And just by looking at the numbers, you can see how the race is going. So cephalosporins, a great option, but again, we're finding problems with resistances. Um, the next and third major category I just want to touch on tonight because they're so widely used in our community are tetracyclines. Tetracyclines are a different kind of antibiotic. They have a cool name, tetracycline. If you break the word down, tetra means four, cycline means ring. So when you look at the chemical structure, it kind of makes sense. It's a four-ringed antibiotic. Um, also discovered right after World War II. But the hallmark difference with your tetracyclines is that they are bacteria static. What bacteria static means is that when you take a tetracycline, it doesn't wipe out that infectious agent. What it does instead is it stops the bacteria from experiencing further growth. As you can see on this figure, what happens with a tetracycline is the chemical comes in and binds to a structure inside of the bacterial cell called the ribosome. And when that drug binds to the ribosome, it prevents the bacteria's ability to do a process called translation. So what that means is the bacteria can no longer produce no pro new proteins. If you can't produce new proteins, you're certainly going to slow the growth and spread of that bacteria significantly. Another interesting thing about tetracyclines is they act for different periods of time. You have short-acting tetracyclines that work for 6 to 12 hours, um, intermediate tetracyclines that act for 12 to 13 hours, and then your long-acting, uh, such as doxycycline, that act for 18 to 20 hours. Now it's important to note with these different lengths of activity for these antibiotics is that you really have to pay attention when you get a prescription to when it says take this once a day or take this twice a day or take this three times a day. That doesn't just mean you take one, two or three pills in the morning. That means you surely should spread those dosings out as prescribed. Because what will happen is if you only take one dose in the morning, that if it's a short-acting tetracycline, it will bind to that ribosome, it will stop protein production for that six hours. However, as soon as that six hours is done, the bacteria will start to replicate and you'll see growth continue again. And so really important thing to note here is that pay attention to how frequently you're supposed to be taking your antibiotics. Another interesting kind of factoid about your tetracyclines is that we find, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, they frequently lead to what we call secondary infections. So what happens with your tetracyclines is if you were to take these tetracyclines, um, they will stop not only the growth of the bad bacteria causing the infection, let's say, in your arm, but it will stop the growth of most of the bacteria in your body. Now, we know that you have lots of different types of bacteria inside of you. The um, current numbers that we, we think are pretty accurate is that you have somewhere between 100 and 200 bacteria for every one of your human cells. So in reality, humans are mostly just large bags of bacteria. Um, and so by, if you start inhibiting your good bacteria, your commensal bacteria, from being able to replicate, that has ramifications. And so one of the things that we'll see um, with people taking tetracyclines for long periods of time is a subsequent infection with a fungus called Candidia albicans. Now that's really interesting. So taking an antibiotic is leading to a fungal infection. How does that work? What ends up happening 
is that while you're taking your tetracycline antibiotic and you're stopping the bad bacteria from growing, you're also stopping good bacteria from growing, then what's going to happen is you have just changed that microenvironment of your body. Now, in places such as the mouth, um, if you don't have bacteria dividing and replicating in your mouth, it will change the pH of your mouth. Once you change that pH of your mouth, an opportunistic infection such as Candidia albicans can come in and establish itself and you'll, have, you'll develop a disease that we call thrush. Um, Candidia albicans can also present in other places in the body and cause presentations such as um, um, yeast infections in women. And again, what's happening here is that the good bacteria aren't able to replicate just like the bad bacteria can't replicate. So then the question might come up is why take tetracyclines at all? Well, you have to remember, like we've been discussing, you have good and bad bacteria. And you don't want to just wipe out all of the E. coli in your body, for example. If I have an infection, an E. coli infection in my hand, I want to clear the infection from my hand, but not from my GI tract. That's where drugs such as tetracyclines can come into use. And so what you can see here, I hope, is just by glancing at these first three categories of antibiotics, you can start to have an appreciation that we have a variety of different categories of tools for treating all kinds of different bacterial infections. So what do we use them for? What are we using these antibiotics for? Well, most people would say, well, infections, right? But the reality, as you can see here from the list, is we actually, here in the United States, by far use antibiotics to treat things like acne. By far the number one player. A lot of times when, when talking to students about this topic, they assume that UTIs, urinary tract infections, have to be number one, right? We treat so many UTIs in the clinical setting. In reality, that's all the way towards the bottom of the list at number 10. And so what I can hope you can appreciate by looking at this list is we use these variety of antibodies to treat all kinds of different things, not just infections clinically. Um, I wanted to also kind of just show you here a few lists. So if we look at the greater Fort Wayne area in Allen County, these are the top 10 brand name antibiotics that are prescribed in this region. And you've probably heard of them before. So just picking a few off the list. Augmentin, Keflax, Bactrim. These may be antibiotics that you actually have in your home right now. Now you might also notice that these names are all shown in blue. That's because when I teach this um, topic for my courses, I have linked all of these out to a website and I'd like to offer that website to you now. That website that I send my students to is called drugs.com. And I know it sounds kind of funny recommending people to go to a website called drugs.com. Uh, but what I have found to be extremely helpful with this website, it, it has been written in a way that a common person that has no scientific training could get an idea of how their antibiotic is working inside of them. Not only does it tell you the mode of action for the antibiotic, it also tells you any signs or symptoms you may be experiencing. It warns you of cross reactions with other medications you may be taking. And it's written in a fantastic way that anybody from a scientist to grandma can understand the website. And so if you are on an antibiotic and you wonder how does it actually work, I really recommend checking out that website. In addition to these brand name antibiotics, others that you may be familiar with, here's the top 10 list of generic antibiotics prescribed in the greater Fort Wayne um, area. Again, things that you're probably very familiar with, amoxicillin, doxycycline, um, you know, azithromycin. These are all very, very common antibiotics that have specific uses. Now, if we were to look at all of these antibiotics as a whole, we can actually start to put them into categories based off of how effective they are on a variety of infections. So the way that you can split that down is by dividing these antibiotics up to, um, into categories, such as broad spectrum antibiotics and narrow spectrum antibiotics. 
your broad spectrum antibiotics are incredibly helpful for bacterial infections that you don't quite know what you're dealing with. So for example, if an individual would come into a hospital setting and they would have a severe infection, but we don't know what it is, it might be really quick and easy to just put them on a broad spectrum antibiotic that can treat a variety of infectious microorganisms and take a culture. And by the time we get the results back from the lab, we can maybe find if there's a better fit to put them on. They're great for treating a variety of bacteria. But once we know, once we know the exact beasts that we're dealing with, we can actually change that antibiotic to a narrow spectrum antibiotic that sometimes have less cross reactivity with other drugs and may be more effective, effective for your specific infection. Just to show you an example of how these broad versus narrow spectrum antibiotics may be used. If you were, for example, to have a random infection but we're not sure what it is, you may be put on a tetracycline. Tetracyclines work for gram-positive, gram-negative bacterias, your chlamydias, your rickettsias. They have a variety of effective ranges. Um, same thing here with your carpobiums. They work for the vast majority of your gram-negative bacteria and your gram-positive bacteria. However, on a variety of these, you can't use them for your mycobacterium. Your mycobacterium, such as mycobacterium tuberculosis or mycobacterium leperi, the causative agents of tuberculosis and leprosy, um, you have some significantly more limited choices. And so the take home message here is that depending on what type of actual bacterial infection you have, certain antibiotics will be helpful and others will not. The next thing I just wanted to briefly mention, and we're not going to go into all the detail on this slide, is that in addition to having a variety of brand name and generic antibiotics and having 10 different classes of antibiotics to choose from, we can categorize them based on their mechanism of drug action or how they actually are having an impact on the bacteria which is infecting you. So some of these, um, antibiotics work by inhibiting protein production. We kind of gave you an example of that earlier. Other antibiotics, for example, may stop a bacteria's ability to do proper metabolism. Others will literally stop production of the cell wall. Others, in fact, will dissolve or puncture the cell membrane of the bacterium. And finally, others specifically go through and they attack either the DNA or RNA processes, so the genomic processes of that infectious bacteria. So overall, up to this point, the story sounds pretty good. We have a lot of options, we have a lot of tools and ways that we can protect ourselves from bacteria infections. And in reality, I would love if we could just stop there. However, um, we live in the real world, and in the real world, we have some very significant challenges. And I want to just kind of mention what those challenges look like. What are we seeing clinically? What are we seeing in the hospital in terms of antibiotic resistance? Starting back in 2013, the CDC started publishing these lists of what they called the biggest threats. These are bacterial infections that have the biggest clinical um, impact the highest risk for severe disease, or even the highest risk for mortality. And so the CDC curates this list of bacteria and determines you know, what we should be looking out for. And so this next section here, we're going to talk about microbial resistance or antibiotic resistance and how it develops. So to kind of clue you in to how these bacteria are somehow able to avoid these amazing antibiotics we have. Um, I have this slide here, which I'm going to kind of give you a window into the mechanisms in which these bacteria do that. So here you have a cartoon picture of a bacterium. And when you look inside of a bacterium, they have a lot of their own DNA, their chromosome, which not, is not listed on this picture. However, they also contain these plasmids. What plasmids are, are small circular loops of DNA. And these small circular loops of DNA 
are where bacteria like to keep what we call their virulence factors. These virulence factors are the tools and tricks that the bacteria uses to survive and persist inside of you and evade your immune responses. And so what you see here is a nice colorful loop of DNA that we call a plasmid. And I wanna show you some examples of these virulence factors. So here, right here, this gray gene that you're seeing on this little part of the plasmid goes through a process called transcription and translation. That transcription and translation produces a protein, and in this example, that protein is an efflux pump, which mounts itself into the cell wall of the bacteria. And what's interesting about these efflux pumps is that if you were to get an infection, and you were to take the antibodies, antibiotics as prescribed to you, those antibiotics would get into your body, they would circulate through your bloodstream, they would find the bacteria, they even would get into the bacterium infecting your body. However, these efflux pumps will simply just pump the antibiotic out as fast as it gets inside. And so for all intents and purposes, it's just like you didn't take the antibiotic at all. So a very impressive antibiotic evasion technique. Another thing that's equally impressive is that bacteria can have several copies or several versions of these efflux pumps on their plasmids. I've personally worked with bacterium that have nine different versions of these efflux pumps. That would be incredibly frustrating for you as a patient if you went into a hospital setting, got an antibiotic, and it failed. You were moved to another antibiotic, and it failed. And you did that process another eight times, and the antibiotics just aren't working. Very interesting um, mode of antibiotic resistance. Um, another option shown here in green, this green gene that you're seeing on the plasmid, again, will go through transcription and translation, and proteins will be made inside of the bacteria. And what these proteins do, shown in green here, is that even if you take your antibiotic, that antibiotic is internalized and brought into the bacteria, what these green proteins will do is simply coat and surround that antibiotic, neutralizing it. So the antibiotic gets into the bacterium, however, this protein neutralizes that antibiotic and can have no chemical effect. Very interesting strategy. A third strategy I'd like to mention is shown here in orange. Bacteria can produce enzymes that it then releases into the environment. So these are enzymes that are secreted out into your tissues or out into your bloodstream. And what happens with these orange enzymes is that they go out into the body into circulation and when you take your antibiotics, they bind to these antibiotics and then dissolve it away. So when they bind to the antibiotic and dissolve it away, what's happening is that that antibiotic actually never gets to the bacteria itself. Never even makes it to the bacteria. It's destroyed before it gets there. Very interesting strategy. And then the last strategy that I want to just mention is down here, is if you take an antibiotic that starts attacking a specific target inside of a bacteria, the bacteria may mutate to just create a different target, to create some other structure that that antibiotic can no longer bind to. So the take home message that I hope you take from this slide is that bacteria have a variety of mechanisms that they can use to evade this nice repertoire of antibiotics that we've created. It's an interesting strategy and bacteria can have several different versions of these or all of these versions in one single species of bacteria. So this changes the game a little bit. We have now made the checkers game into chess. We're going to see what happens. So to make this a little bit more real, I thought I'd give you some um, actual examples of these biggest threats that the CDC curates. Um, why not start off here with one that I think we're probably all have at least heard of. So maybe you've heard of MRSA. MRSA stands for Methicillin Resistant Staph Aureus or Staphylococcus Aureus. And when we look at MRSA, it has a long storied history. MRSA first became prevalent in hospitals in the late 60s. I believe it was 1968 when we started seeing the first cases of MRSA in the hospitals. Now what was interesting is with MRSA, we first saw the cases predominantly only in hospitals. That's why we gave it the name HA-MRSA or HA-MRSA. HA-MRSA stands for Hospital Acquired MRSA. 
Now, I think the misunderstanding is that Staphylococcus is somehow rare. Uh, we know, perhaps, that in reality, about one-third, somewhere around 33% of people, carry Staphylococcus aureus in your nose at any given time. So one-third of the people in your life right now actually have active Staphylococcus aureus inside their nasal cavity. Um, even more striking is two in a hundred people are carrying MRSA. So they're not just carrying Staphylococcus aureus, they have a antibiotic resistant Staph aureus in their body. Now, from the 60s onwards, we saw an explosion of hospital-acquired MRSA in the hospital settings. So much so that people would go in for standard surgeries, elective procedures, and they would end up getting these MRSA infections, and unfortunately, some people did die from them. And so the hospitals came up with very aggressive plans to try to stop the spread of MRSA within their hospitals. And as you can see on the slides, they have gotten pretty effective on it. If we just look at the data between 2005 and 2011, we saw a 54% decrease in hospital-acquired MRSA infections during that time period. That's not bad at all. And we've moved to 9,000 fewer deaths in the hospitals during that same period. So it almost seems like we had it under control. However, we had the next thing on the slide come up. We stopped seeing MRSA only in the hospitals and started to see it appear in the community. Um, this version that we call um, CA MRSA or CA MRSA stands for Community Acquired MRSA. And these infections have become pretty common. Just to show how common these infections have become, in about 2015, the CDC did a study where they left their home base, so CDC Atlanta, and went around residences through Atlanta and just swabbed people's homes. So they'd knock on the door, say, hey, can we swab your house? And they'd go through and just swab various surfaces in people's homes. Then what they did is they, they did some culturing to see which ones of those homes that they swabbed had MRSA in them and, you know, where did they find it? So I want you to think in your head, your home, your house, and think about this process, if this were to happen in your home. What percentage of homes do you think that the CDC found actually had MRSA in the home? 5%? 20%? Maybe you're pessimistic. Maybe 50% of the homes had MRSA in the home. In reality, nearly every single home, nearly 100% of the homes tested, had MRSA in the house. And so MRSA no longer is just a hospital-acquired infection. It's in your home. And so we have to be very careful because as you can see from these clinical photos here, MRSA can present in a variety of different ways, mostly on the skin. You could have open wounds that simply just do not heal. You can have wounds that pus and seep liquid. Um, another common way that we'll see MRSA infections um, is this is an individual that had an injury and got MRSA into the tissue of their leg. And um, um, this presen presentation is called cellulitis. And so we are seeing MRSA not just acquired in hospitals, but also from the community. When we look at how does this all stack up, the numbers start to get quite striking. So the top half of this figure, you can see that we have approximately 80,000 cases of MRSA every year and 11,000 associated deaths. Pretty striking numbers. But this is a talk about antibiotic resistance. And I unfortunately have to report that antibiotic resistance didn't just stop with methicillin. We now, just like we saw in 1968 with the emergence of MRSA, we now are seeing the emergence of a new um, antibiotic-resistant Staphylococcus aureus called VERSA. VERSA stands for vancomycin-resistant Staph aureus. And this one, to be honest with you, is pretty troubling. Vancomycin is what we consider a top-tier antibiotic. It is very highly effective in most cases. However, in infections like VERSA, we're seeing situations where we have ran out of the next antibiotic to try. 
Um, vancomycin is no joke. This antibiotic is typically de uh, delivered intravenously, and you have to track how much vancomycin is in the bloodstream, because if a person is dosed too highly, it can actually do damage to the organs. So we very closely track how much antibiotic is in that person's body at the time. That's how powerful vancomycin is. Now we're running into situations Again, very small case numbers, only 13 or so case numbers, but that's how MRSA started, but we're seeing these cases spread. There is no option after vancomycin. There is not the next best drug. If you end up with a Versa infection, most of the time you're going to be injected with what we call an antibiotic cocktail. It's throwing everything in the kitchen sink at the problem. You're going to be giving any antibiotic that we can find to try to cure the infection, and most of the time it will fail. And so, very interesting infection that we have on the horizon. Now, Staphylococcus aureus isn't the only vancomycin-resistant um, bacterium we're dealing with today. We also have, and we have we've had these cases in Allen County, VRE, or vancomycin-resistant enterococcus. This is an interesting case because enterococcus is normally a commensal. It's a good guy inside of your body. But as it's become more antibiotic resistant, we're seeing it spread in hospital settings. Again, because it's vancomycin resistant, we have to deliver this antibiotic cocktail to, to try to help you. Um, but the reality is, is if you come down with a VRE infection, uh, mortality rates are in the ballpark of 60 to 70 percent, um, even with the best medical treatment that we can provide. So vancomycin resistance bacteria in bacteria is incredibly serious. We also are seeing the emergence of carpomium resistance enterobaceae, CRE. Um, basically, uh, basically, it's clinically untreatable. Um, the cases of CRE, um, especially in the region, are on the rise. And the unfortunate part is we've had emergence of nearly completely antibiotic resistant CRE. There's no treatment options available. If a person goes into a hospital with a CRE infection and that infection gets into their bloodstream, so they have a bacteremia or a septicemia, they have a greater than a 50% chance of, of not making it. And so these infections are serious. In addition to the carpobium resistant enterobaceae, we're also seeing carpobium resistant acinobacter. The problem with acinobacters is these bacteria survive on surfaces for incredibly long periods of time. So we're seeing spread of this in healthcare facilities, long-term care facilities, nursing facilities, where a patient is moved from one room to another, or medical equipment is moved from one room to another, and we're seeing cases of CRA spreading um, in the hospital setting. If you look at the numbers, it doesn't matter which way you look at the numbers. It's tragic on all fronts. 8,500 cases a year, 700 deaths a year. The monetary costs are astronomical. In just this one bacterium alone, the United States is experiencing $281 million in cost. Another infection that you've probably heard of before is C. diff. Um, Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, um, if you work in the healthcare setting, you know what I'm talking about because it has a very unique and special smell. Um, C. diff you will see in patients that are on long-term antibiotic therapies. So if you are placed on a long-term antibiotic treatment, what that can do is it can deplete your natural bacteria inside your body, giving C. diff a window, a foothold, to replicate inside of your systems. Um, people that have C. diff will experience extreme GI distress, um, really nasty bouts of diarrhea, and um, oftentimes people that are hospitalized with C. diff will have extended stays because of that. Due to the additional medical treatment and the fact that people have extended medical stays, as of just 20, I believe this chart here is from 2017, our costs for C. diff infections alone in the United States is exceeding $1 billion annually. And so as we start adding the math up, you can see that this antibiotic resistance problem is very real and very widespread. Um, my, I think my last example of bacteria that I want to give you is probably one of the more concerning. Um, 
it was in 2015, we had a fully antibiotic resistant strain of gonorrhea come over to the United States from Tokyo. Um, this version of gonorrhea is untreatable. The problem with that is, is gonorrhea being an STI, a sexually transmitted infection, we are going to see this infection spread rapidly and across the country. If you just look at the data alone, in 2019, there were a reported 616,000 cases of gonorrhea just in one year. That number of 616,000 is a 50% increase in four years. So you go from 2015 to 2019 and you're up 50%. And so we don't have an answer for this, folks. We don't know what the next step is. We do know that this bacterium is here and we know it's going to spread. I also don't want to give you the idea that it's just bacteria that we're dealing with issues with. I mean, I know we're living in a pandemic a viral pandemic right now, and I'm talking to you a lot about bacteria, but there's another player to the party that I just want you to be aware of. So you may have heard of this drug-resistant Candidia auris. This is a fungal infection. So not only are we dealing with drug-resistant bacterial infections, we're also seeing drug-resistant fungal infections. What's very interesting about Candidia auris is that it emerged, and we're not quite sure how or why, but it seemingly emerged in four separate places across the globe simultaneously. So at nearly the exact same time, this drug-resistant Candidia auris appeared in Northern South America, in Southern Africa, and in India, as well as Japan. And we can actually track through contact tracing and a variety of other mechanisms to where these specific versions, these specific strains of this drug-resistant Candidia auris resides in the United States. Um, what's unfortunate about, unfortunate about fungal infections are that typically these mycoses or these fungal infections are very, very difficult to treat because many times fungal medications can do significant damage to the body if you're on them for long periods of time. So I hope the take home message that you have so far is twofold. We have some wonderful drugs that we've developed over time and now we have some significant challenges. So to close things out tonight, I'd like to just discuss to you how do we move forward? What do we do next? How do we as a society and as a globe impact this problem? And so when we look back at the 20th century and the history books are completely written, I think that people will look at the 20th century as the golden age of antibiotics, where we had control over bacterial infectious disease and we had great mechanisms to be able to prevent their spread, prevent severe illness, and to pre prevent death. But when we look at today, mortality rates because of infectious disease are on the rise. So the question we have to then ask, is this all because of drug resistance? And the answer to that is no. Drug resistance plays a large role in the antibiotic resistance problem, but it's only one factor. A couple of other things that we should consider is the fact that first, we overuse and overprescribe antibiotics. There have been countless cases that I've been told where people have gone to clinics for viral infections and have come back with an antibiotic. Antibiotics are against bacteria. They're not going to have an impact on your viral infection. And so overuse overprescription of antibiotics have caused people to take medications that they simply do not need and will not be effective against their viral infection or their fungal infection. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two, and probably the most significant challenge, is how do we deal with the fact that people do not take their medication as prescribed? And so if you were to get an antibiotic prescribed to you, it might say something to the effect of take one pill every day for 10 days. Typically what happens is an individual takes their antibiotic for several days, they start to feel better, and they just stop taking them. 
sound familiar? And this happens all over the place. Um, the number of people that actually take antibiotics as prescribed is significantly and depressingly low. So think in your head, if a doctor were to give you a prescription, what do you think in the United States might be the number of people that actually take their antibiotics as prescribed? That number is called compliance. What is antibiotic compliance in the United States? Would you guess 90%, 50%? 20%, in all cases, you would be wrong. Compliance for antibiotics in the United States is an abysmal 10%. So only 10% of people are taking antibiotics as prescribed. The problem with this is that we are exposing bacteria to a challenge. You're not killing them, but you're exposing them to a challenge. And like in society in general, some people when exposed to a challenge crumble. However, there's all of the other people that rise up to the occasion. Bacteria are the same way. Many of them, when exposed to an antibiotic challenge, die. They don't make it. However, there are those special few that mutate or find ways around that antibiotic and they thrive. And so by not being compliant and taking your antibiotics, we're opening new doors for antibiotic resistance. So what can we do? What can be done to better our situation. The number one answer I typically hear is, well, why don't we just make new antibiotics that seem to have worked in the past? Let's, let's just make more. Well, there's some significant challenges to that. Um, the biggest challenge to this is the fact that to go to, through the process of drug discovery, so doing mass screenings, toxicology studies, patents, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials typically take several years and on average to get one drug from concept to market on average takes about $1 billion. That's a lot of money. Now I want you to think of the last time you went to a pharmacy to pick up an antibiotic. How much did you pay? Most people when picking up antibiotics from a pharmacy don't pay anything. They're free. Many pharmacies, even here in Allegheny County, advertise free antibiotics. So if you were the CEO of a pharmaceutical company and you have the cost of developing an antibiotic drug of a billion dollars and you know that people aren't going to pay anything if maybe five bucks for that antibiotic, how are you going to be able to justify that to your shareholders? And the fact is, is the CEOs of the biggest pharma companies in the United States cannot make that justification. That's why as of 2017, every large pharmaceutical company in the United States had shut down the antibiotic divisions. It's a problem. It's a situation. The money is not there to develop the new antibiotics. So where is it going to come from? Where is the solution going to present itself? And the answer is we don't have the answer to that right now. We have a lot of people at universities doing research. We have private companies doing research, but they don't have the resources and they don't have the billions of dollars that large pharmaceutical companies or governments have to develop these medications. But we as a society and we as a globe cannot sit idly by. When you look at the projections and you look at where we are today, and where we could be going, the data is striking. If you look at this graph here, this is a estimation um, done by the Review on Antimicrobial Resistance. So this is a society of experts on antimicrobial resistance. You can see by the year 2050 that antibi antibiotic resistance related deaths in the United States are going to be 317,000 people annually. That is every year. That's a pretty big number. If we extrapolate that data out to the entire world, the number gets even more scary. So based off of current numbers with the antibiotic resistances that we're seeing today, the estimation is that we will see 10 million deaths annually every year by the year 2050. It's 2021. 
almost 2022. 2050 is not that long, long down the road. We're talking about your kids, we're talking about your grandkids that are going to be dealing with this issue. Just to give you an idea, 10 million deaths is more than cancer and diabetes combined annually, every year. And so we as a society have to realize that we are facing a wall and we are going to have to come together as a team to find a way around it. So I'd like to close today with a quote. And the quote says, a post-antibiotic era means in effect an end to modern medicine as we know it. Things as common as strep throat or a child's scratched knee could once again kill. That quote is by Margaret Chan, the director of the General World Health Organization. The reality is, is we were once in this same situation before. You can take a walk in any cemetery around this country and you'll find that there are a lot of graves of people that died at the same time. There were outbreaks of cholera, dysentery, and other infections that we simply did not have the tools to fight. And we are about to be in that same situation again. So much so that the World Health Organization has officially declared that we have now entered the post-antibiotic era. So in today's lecture, I hope I've provided you with a better understanding of the history of antibiotics here in the United States. You have a better appreciation of the challenges that bacteria provide us and what we're seeing clinically in terms of antimicrobial infection and, and how can we, as a society, look at these challenges and come together to better address the road that's before us. And so I wanna just close by saying thank you for your time. I've really enjoyed this opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Michael. That was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I have several questions, and I hope some of our viewers will uh, enter some in the, in the chat box for us. I guess one of the first ones that comes to mind right away from listening to your talk is when you mentioned that a third of the people have MRSA in their mouths or whatever walking around at any one time and 100% yeah. in their homes yeah. practically. Why, what prevents that from spreading even more than it does, or what, how long is it in someone's mouth? Yeah, so um, a lot of the Staph aureus that people have in their mouth, so the 33% the, um, that I mentioned, that 33% has Staph aureus, but that doesn't mean that it's drug resistant Staph aureus. Okay. It's that two in 100 that have the MRSA in, in, in their nasal cavity. Um, but the reality is, is for an infection to really take hold, several things have to happen. You have to get exposed to that bacteria, so you actually have to come in contact with it. You have to come in contact it in what's called its preferred portal of entry. Every infectious agent has a specific way it wants to get inside of you. For example, COVID-19, right? SARS-CoV-2 virus wants to get in through the respiratory route. If you don't come in contact with that microorganism via its preferred method of entry, you're probably not going to suffer an infection. The other thing is the dose, the inoculum. How much of that bacterium are you exposed to? If it's just a small amount on the countertop, there might not be enough of that bacteria present to cause an active infection inside of you. So that's why we're not experiencing everyone in the country having MRSA infections simultaneously, because all three of those factors have to happen um, in order for you to get an established infection. So you mentioned countertop. How much does antibacterial soaps and cleaners and all this stuff contribute to this problem, if at all? Um, depends on what you're using. A lot of the common household cleaners have high concentrations of either alcohol or a chemical called surfactant that tear open the cell walls of the bacteria. If those cleaning agents are truly destroying those, those um, bacteria, then you don't have the opportunity to develop resistance, right? If, if you kill the infectious agent, you can't develop resistance. It's where we provide a challenge that's non-lethal, a sub-lethal challenge uh, that allows these mutations to occur at a higher rate. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if we did everything right, we would still see some mutations occur. Right? Bacteria are constantly mutating. Viruses are constantly mutating. It's just what can we do from helping that situation along? What can we do to prevent further mutation? 
Um, another thing that came to my mind is uh, uh, explain the difference for the common man between antibiotics and antibodies, which oh. in your, you know, COVID antibodies is a good thing. You want the yeah. antibodies, but. Um. No, that's a great question. So when you're dealing with um, antibiotics, antibiotics are typically um, chemicals that are going to go through and attack some physical property of a bacteria. So what that, what that um, antibiotic is going to do is attack the cell wall, attack the membrane of the bacteria, its ability to do metabolism. You're, you're using a chemical to physically assault that, that bacteria to help clear the infection. Now antibodies are different. Antibodies are molecules that your body produces to activate your immune response to clear an infection. So most antibodies, what they're going to do is they are gonna serve as targets. They are going to go around and bind to that infectious bacteria and alert your immune cells to go attack that infection. So whereas the antibiotic is a chemical acting on its own to attack the bacterium, your antibodies are there to serve as markers or flags to allow your own immune system to clear that infection. So similar but different yeah. ways of handling infectious disease. Okay. Uh, another question I had, just bear with me for a minute no, you, on this these one. are great, these are um, fantastic. So the bubonic plague, Black Death, yeah. uh, in the Middle Ages was a bacterial disease, correct? Correct. Um, fleas from rodents typically. Yep. And, and you know, it killed up to 50% of the population in Europe yeah. Something uh, higher in some places. Uh, my question is, what prevented it from being even higher? There weren't obviously antibiotics. No one had any natural immunity to it. So, um, what what prevented it from just wiping out practically everybody? Um, is, do some people develop something? So what um, what you're describing is called bottlenecking. And so when you have a significant challenge like bubonic plague, right? You're dealing with infectious bacteria like Yersinia pestis. And there's a variety of other plagues that have occurred, occurred in human history as well. What happens is that there are people that are susceptible and it's gonna wipe them out. And that's what happened in Europe is over half of the population died. And so what happened is that there were a certain subset of people that their genetics, their physical genetic mu mutations, their physical being of who they were made them resistant to some of the properties of that infection. It didn't mean they were completely immune to that infection, but it helped them to clear it better. And so the fact is, is the people that had that mutation lived and the people that didn't have that mutation didn't make it. Um, we can actually track the genetics of people that came from Europe out of the bubonic plague and we can show that the people that survived plague, the vast majority of them had that specific mutation which allowed them to survive. We see that in other places as well. Believe it or not, there's actually 1% of the global population that is 100% immune to HIV and AIDS infection. It's because they have a specific mutation in the receptors on their T cells that they cannot, even if you inject someone with straight HIV AIDS virus, um, they, can't, they can't be infected with mm -hmm. it. And so there are mutations that are advantageous and there are mutations in, in people's genomes that are deleterious, they're, they're bad. We've seen the same thing with COVID-19 and we're not far enough into COVID-19 with a great enough understanding to know exactly what those mutations are. But you may have heard the tragic stories where entire families have unfortunately not made it whereas someone down the street from you may have gotten COVID and been completely asymptomatic. There is a genetic background to those people that either make them more or less susceptible to infections. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about bacteria, viruses, or fungal infections, that genetic background that you provide, what you are made up of, is going to make you more susceptible or less susceptible to a variety of infectious agents. And this could be obviously a whole nother talk, but yeah. um, how, how would you briefly compare and contrast this, what you've talked about tonight to, to the COVID situation? I mean, it's, it's a virus obviously, but. Yeah, um, just, like, just like bacteria mutate and bacteria evolve around protection mechanisms, viruses do the exact same thing. So for example, I've had a lot of people come up to me and ask, well, I, um, 
I have to get the influenza vaccine every year. Why? You know, why, why do I need that? Well, it's because the influenza virus is a single-stranded RNA virus. Genetically, what that means is that virus mutates very quickly, some of the fastest mutating viruses that are out there. And so what that means is after a year has gone by, that virus has mutated so quickly that it has outrun the vaccine from the previous year. Um, that's why every year we have to get a board of scientists together and say what strains of influenza do we think are going to be present and we develop that year's flu vaccine based off of that guess. Dealing with the current SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS outbreak, um, coronaviruses are also RNA viruses, but they're different in the fact that they have an error-correcting RNA-dependent de um, RNA, uh, RNA polymerase. What this means is that coronaviruses have a self-editing mechanism. What they can do is that when they make mistakes or they have mutations, they fix the vast majority of those mutations. So what we see with coronaviruses in our current pandemic is that mutations are occurring, but they're occurring at a significantly slower rate. So we might get a new variant, let's say maybe one new variant a week instead of 50 new variants a week dealing with other viruses. Mm -hmm. And so we will run into situations where coronaviruses will mutate. Eventually, if we look at the FDA data, we look at all the scientific data that's out there, current best projections are that our vaccines that we have now against COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, should last us a runway somewhere between two and a half to maybe five years if we're lucky. But in reality, it's probably two and a half to three years. There's gonna to have to be a new booster or a new variant that comes out to, um, to help keep coronavirus at bay. So just like bacteria mutate to overcome challenges, as do viruses. So this question might be uh, um, most, most telling to, or most important to some parents out there watching. Uh, you're, I, I've run into this with myself, exactly what you described. Please. You go to the doctor, your, your child's sick, they say it's probably a virus, yeah. but here's a prescription for an antibiotic. Yeah. Should the parents be saying thanks but no thanks? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had that very scenario happen to me. Um, where an antibiotic was offered to help combat a viral infection. Now, I'm not advocating that you go against doctor's orders because most medical doctors and DOs, NPs, PAs are fantastically trained in their understanding of antibiotic medicines. But in, in nearly every case, an antibiotic is going to do little to nothing to fight a viral infection. Now, sometimes it gets complicated. So for example, if you look at a um, lung infection, like a bronchitis infection, you will run into instances where people have a viral infection that follows with a bacterial infection. So clinically, how that ends up working out is someone goes to the clinic and they have bacterial bron or viral bronchitis. The provider will then say, you have a viral infection, there's nothing we can do. Because of molecular processes we don't have time to go into, what ends up happening is two weeks later that same person then gets a bacterial bronchitis. So they come in with a bacterial pneumonia and then the provider goes, oh, well, here's an antibiotic. At that point, the patient gets upset because they feel like that the first person that they saw didn't give them the proper medical treatment when in fact they did. Mm -hmm. They did give them exactly what they needed at the time. And so sometimes these infections can be complicated where one leads to another. One has a good medical treatment and the other really doesn't. Thanks. I apologize to our viewers. I, I lost my screen. Did any chat questions come in? Um, yes. <laughs> um, if I could, yeah. Thank We're going to get some of those chat yeah. questions coming your way. <laughs> Give us a moment here. Oops. Um, I take a Kleenex every time I visit the dentist due to having an artificial joint. Will it eventually become less effective over the years because I take so often? I, I'm sorry, not Kleenex, Keflex. <laughs> Keflex, so an antibiotic. Yes. So this is an individual that takes Keflex every time they go to the dentist? Due to having an artificial joint. Okay. will eventually become less effective over the years because I take it so often. Uh, so typically what you're dealing with here is a preventative treatment. Um, you're at a higher risk to get that bacterial infection because of your, your artificial hip, right? 
-hmm. artificial hip or knee. Mm -hmm. And so um, as long as you're taking the dose as prescribed by your provider, I, I don't think you're running the risk of dealing with you know, antibiotic resistance. The big issue that you'll run into is if people don't take the doses as prescribed. Under dosing or cutting off dosing prematurely is significantly more dangerous. And so I, I would just follow the um, kind of prescription that your provider's given you. Okay, great. Thank you. Anyone else have any chats? We'll say. Anything else you want to sum up or say to? Um, um, <laughs> overall, I, I hope you don't leave tonight's lecture with a doom and gloom attitude. Um, what I'm trying to show you is that we have significant challenges that are going to be coming our way, and some of them are already here. Um, something that's been amazing um, to watch as we've gone through the pandemic is that what good we can do when the world comes together. And so use these challenges as opportunities to come together and meet them as a society. Because when we put our heads together, we can, we can deal with this problem. We've done it before. We're just gonna have to work harder and be more creative to come up with the next solution. So thank you all so much for listening and your time, and I really much appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Michael. Uh, please join us for the next University of St. Francis lecture on Wednesday, January 19th at 6.30 p.m. when Stacy Lehman and Jennifer Cutter will present Weigh In on Child Wellness. This will be an in-person program in the theater of the main library. If you are interested in that program and our other upcoming programs for adults, children, or teens, please visit the Allen County Public Library website at www.acpl.info, where you will find a comprehensive listing of events under the Events tab located at the top of the homepage. Most of the events ask that you register in advance, so please take note of that. If you have any follow-up questions or comments regarding the information shared today, or are in need of additional resources, please contact us at ask at acpl.info. On behalf of Dr. Beachel and the staff at Access Fort Wayne, thank you for attending today's program and have a good evening.